Today's video has a big question that it's going to try to answer. What happens when an inexperienced game studio is set to make the fourth game in a franchise, while an economic recession and the failure of the previous entry irreversibly damages the game's publisher? Well, hopefully we're going to find out. Spoiler alert, this video will contain spoilers for Destroy All Humans, Destroy All Humans 2, Big Willy Unleash, and Path of the Furon. If you don't want to be spoiled, please click away now. It's very clear to me that Path of the Furon had a very unusual, troubled development. Developed by Sandblast Games and published by THQ, Path of the Furon was released on December 1st, 2008 for the Xbox 360, with the intended PlayStation 3 version being completely absent. I did some digging around to try and find out some more information about Sandblast and their history, as well as the circumstances behind Path of the Furon's development. Here's what I found. Sandblast Games began its existence as Cranky Pants Games, still a THQ developer even then. I was only able to confirm that they had developed two games under the Cranky Pants Games name. The GameCube version of Red Faction 2, and all of the versions of Evil Dead Regeneration. By 2008, the company had been rechristened as Sandblast Games, and they worked on Path of the Furon during this brief period. Now here's where things get really weird. Anybody who's even remotely familiar with recent history will be able to tell you about how our economy fell faster than my interest in Big Willy Unleashed in 2008. And with the magical powers of hindsight being 2020, we know that THQ went bankrupt just five years later in 2013. In November of 2008, THQ had to go through layoffs and close down five studios entirely. This Polygon article presents a letter, supposedly from the CEO of THQ, citing financial difficulties as the reason for these cuts. Most notably among the closures were Locomotive Games and Sandblast Games. The article was dated November 3rd, 2008, meaning that THQ shut down the developer of Path of the Furon not even a month before the game was released in North America. Even weirder, Sandblast Games couldn't get the PS3 version into a functional, playable state. But somehow, when the PAL version came out on February 13th, 2009, a PlayStation 3 version along with the Xbox 360 version was put out by THQ. So either some other studio finished the game in those intervening months, or THQ deliberately shoved a broken game out there. So, with all of that info out of the way, now that your standards are so low that you cannot possibly be disappointed by this mess of a game, let the plot commence. It's 1979, and apparently Crypto was not kidding about his plan for the little town in Nevada. A few years ago, Crypto got into a drunk flying incident leading to him crashing the saucer in front of a casino in Los Paradiso, Nevada. Crypto and Pox took advantage of the situation. Crypto and Pox took advantage of the situation by opening up the Space Dust Casino and theming it around aliens, which gave them a steady DNA and cash flow. Speaking of DNA, they brought back DNA in this game as the main currency, as now the Poxmart takes DNA and with the removal of the gene blender, Abducting people with the saucer is a great way to get lots of DNA quickly instead. The game begins with a show called In Quest For, hosted by news reporter Veronica Stone. Cause, you know, starting off a Destroy All Humans game with the characters watching television has always worked out perfectly in the past, right? Discussing Bigfoot before Crypto shuts off the TV and talks with Pox about how gullible humans are. The Molinari brothers, a mafia family who runs their competing casino, Nero's Palazzo, has sent somebody to infiltrate their casino, and after finishing his interrogation, Crypto defends the space dust from a group of Molinari mobsters. He then infiltrates their casino and smashes up the place, scaring off their customers and costing them lots of money, leading to the Molinari's declaring war against Crypto. In case you weren't paying attention to the series, Crypto wins and takes over Los Paradiso. Around this time, Crypto starts hearing a voice in his head that is trying to teach Crypto about the paths of enlightenment and how to advance in those paths. The path of the mind upgrades cortex scan and hypnotize. The path of the body upgrades body snatching. 
the path of space upgrades PK and transmog, and the path of time upgrades crypto's newest power, the temporal fist, which is something we'll talk about more later. Using these powers builds up your progress towards the next level in their respective paths, and you go to the meditation chamber, a new feature of the saucer, in order to level up in a path after using that path's powers enough times. Anyway, while Crypto can hear this voice, Pox cannot, and as a result, Pox has no idea what Crypto is talking about. But they don't have a whole lot of time to try to figure it out, because they get attacked by Nexosporidium warriors, a mysterious race from planet Furon that they thought was extinct. Hmm... Crypto and Pox being confronted by an alien race they thought was extinct? Hmm, where have I heard that one before? Crypto is able to defeat them, and Pox then orders Crypto to destroy the entirety of Lost Paradiso with his new saucer, including the Space Dust Casino, in order to erase any evidence of their presence, and the duo flees to Sunnywood. Sunnywood has a bit of an interesting story going on. A parody of Scientology, called the Lunarian Church of Alientology, led by C. Kurt Calvin, and Crypto and Pox suspect that just like them, Calvin is a Furon in a human disguise who was there to harvest DNA. The duo seeks out Veronica Stone, the reporter from the beginning of the game, in order to get help luring out Calvin, rescuing her when the Lunarians kidnap her. She aids them by getting them into contact with an individual within the organization known as Deep Navel. Deep Navel helps Crypto in exchange for Crypto doing favors for him and allowing Navel to take credit for his deeds in order to advance within the organization. Navel has Crypto force a scientist named James Grandy into admitting that he believes in aliens. Then he has Crypto make a movie about aliens. And then finally, he has Crypto cause one billion dollars worth of destruction in Sunnywood. Naval double-crosses Crypto, however, due to Crypto's actions having allowed him to become Calvin's right-hand man. In a last-ditch effort, Crypto and Pox organize a big alien arrival at the Sunnywood Bowl, which successfully lures in C. Kurt Calvin. When they demand that Calvin drops his disguise, the event is attacked by a Nixosporidium walker, which tramples Calvin to death, revealing that he was actually a human all along. After a short boss fight involving Crypto shooting the Nexosporidium Walker's family jewels, the Walker is brought down. Much like the Orangeov Blisk Mutant boss fight from Destroy All Humans 2, the Nexosporidium Walker becomes a recurring, albeit not too frequently seen, enemy for the rest of the game. Their celebration is short-lived, however, as Crypto is shot with a dart, and he faints as a result. Days later, in the Chinese city of Shenlong, Crypto awakens inside of a monastery run by an old Furon martial arts master, simply known as the Master, who is the Furon that Crypto was hearing in his head earlier. After a fight, Crypto agrees to become a student of the Master and hone his powers, learning the Temporal Fist technique, which allows Crypto to freeze time, then throw an enemy or object using PK, and then unfreezing time causing a far more powerful throw than any of Crypto's normal PK abilities could ever do. The Master also has a very interesting backstory that I think sets up the rest of the game's story pretty well. 100 years ago, traitors of the Furon Empire marked a younger Emperor Meningitis for death, but the Master was able to stop them from succeeding in their scheme. However, the Master ended up becoming marked for death himself. To survive, the Master fled to planet Earth, crash-landing somewhere near China. China. Despite seeking out revenge, he began to become immersed in the Chinese culture, thinking it could improve his powers. But eventually, he lost interest in revenge, and instead opened up an academy in order to pass on his knowledge and wisdom to others. One of his students, a man named Saxon, became power-hungry and formed the White Dragon Kung Fu Society to fight the Master. The Master wants Crypto to organize a martial arts tournament in order to lure out Saxon, and he has to get the fighters to do so. Crypto deals with one of Saxon's men, Rolo, getting back the Master's Jade Talisman and getting him to help gather the fighters. Crypto comes back to the monastery and witnesses the Master and Saxon in a fight, and he witnesses Saxon killing the Master in cold blood. 
Crypto retrieves the Jade Talisman from the Master and has a pretty interesting boss fight against Saxon, who is riding a dragon, which makes great use of the Temporal Fist ability in terms of its gameplay. You know, I would question the fact that this game has a boss fight where an alien fights a dragon on top of a giant rock, but honestly, uh, after Big Willy Unleashed, just about any crazy thing could happen in this series. Maybe I'm taking too many cheap shots at Big Willy Unleashed, I'm sorry. After defeating him, Crypto angrily tries to interrogate Saxon, but is attacked by Nexosporidium warriors, which causes Saxon's death in the process. Afterwards, Pox says that they must have been cloned on Earth, and that there was only one company that would have the ability to do that. So Crypto and Pox now go to the French city of Belleville to investigate Francodyne Industries and hopefully discover who or what is behind the Nexosporinium attacks. Crypto's first move in Belleville is to destroy the Francodyne building, then exploit some of the top scientists' pathological fears in order to get information discovering the location of Francodyne's CEO, Henri Crusteau, an environmentalist and oceanographer. If you'll give me just a moment to go off topic, Crusteau is a parody of the famous oceanographer Jacques Cousteau, who by the way was a big inspiration to Steven Hillenburg in the creation of Spongebob, and Cousteau's French accent is even imitated by the French narrator on that show. More interestingly to me is that the character was blatantly designed to resemble Hugo Drax from the 1979 James Bond film Moonraker. Even cooler, Drax's actor, Michael Lonsdale, was actually hired to voice Crusteau, and they even have the character say a couple of lines from the movie. As a big Bond fan, that charmed me quite a bit. Forgive me for fanboying, let's get back to the plot. Crypto disguises himself as a Francodyne scientist to get into a party that Crusteau is present at. Then he reads mimes until he finds out that a mime will be on stage with him as entertainment. Crypto body snatches the mime and deliberately angers the crowd with a terrible comedy routine in order to be alone with Crusteau. He drops the disguise and tries to talk, leading Crusteau to stab him with a spiny fish and escape, sending Francodyne guards against him. Having learned that Crusteau now plans to make a virus to purge humans of Huron DNA, Crypto goes all in to stop the virus by stopping a robbery of paintings in order to prevent Crusteau from getting the materials needed to make the virus, as well as getting the workers who would be involved to go on strike, and finally destroying the laboratory using the new black hole gun. Crusteau gets small amounts of the virus created, and he tries to use Nexos walkers to distribute it via a nearby river, but Crypto stops this from happening. Come to think of it, Drax had a virus too. Anyway, Crypto confronts Crusteau under the Belleville Tower, and after defeating Crusteau's Nexo Squid Robot, or as I like to call it during the playthrough, Robot Squidward, Crusteau tells Crypto that he had been used, and that he'd never intended to harm the Furon species, stating that he'd had nothing to do with the attack on the space dust, that he'd been feeding the Nexos synthetic DNA, and that the Nexos were responding to a call on Furon before he then finally succumbed to his injuries, as he did fall quite a distance. Crypto, shocked by the fact that the synthetic DNA could even be produced, and feeling like he and Pox had been fooled, hops into the saucer to go to the fourth ring of Furon and confront Emperor Meningitis. After 20 years on the Blue Rock, it was time to go home. When Crypto arrives, his first action is to blindly attack the palace in a fit of rage, causing Meningitis to naturally respond by putting up a shield and kicking them out of the city. After doing some clever puzzles that actually make good use of the temporal fist, the shield is down and the two of them can re-enter the city. They can't enter the palace unless they can get past a biometric scan. Having been a servant to Meningitis in his younger days, Pox can, but he still needs a new body. So they do some favors for two Furon workers, Endometriosis and the Librarian, in order to get the DNA needed to clone Pox into a new body. Although, when they actually do it, Pox ends up being put into a very simian-like body. They need a diversion to enter the palace, so Crypto goes into the human habitat and starts a riot, giving him an opportunity to enter the palace, although Pox had to knock the door down. I guess because he was in the wrong body, the biometric scan didn't work out for them after all. Meningitis has a robot connected to a system inside of the palace that disables all other weaponry. 
but Crypto is able to defeat it by disconnecting it from the system using, you guessed it, the temporal fist, and then making short work of it with his guns. He goes to interrogate Meningitis, but due to Meningitis being very old, you know, 500 years I think is what he is, he turns to dust and dies instead. The Jade Talisman activates, bringing out the Master. It turns out that he was behind everything, sending the Nexos Warriors to Earth, making the synthetic DNA, and setting up Meningitis to be killed while faking his own death so that via the Talisman, which was actually a one-time cloning device, the Master could be snuck into the palace, allowing him to assume the throne. Crypto is not pleased, and with a single gesture, Crypto has Pox smack the Master so hard that he smacks a wall and is crushed like an insect under Godzilla's foot. Crypto takes a bit of the synthetic DNA to try it out, and vomits due to how disgusting it tastes. And Pox tells him that as long as the synthetic DNA will make him ill, he'll always have a purpose. To collect pure natural furon DNA that won't make him disgustingly sick. Or in the series' words, he'll always have a reason to DESTROY ALL HUMANS! Crypto is ready to leave for Earth, but Pox says he's not going with him, instead taking the throne and crowning himself as the new Emperor. Crypto, calling his former commanding officer, Your Majesty, walks out of the palace, saying he'll see Pox in ten years for the sequel. And as he leaves, a bunch of Furons walk in to celebrate their new leader, and we go to the credits. I've got quite a bit that I want to say, but I'll go through the game mechanics and other stuff like that first, as usual. Crypto has his jetpack, saucer, shield, and a bunch of guns. The Zapomatic, Disintegrator Ray, Anal Probe, and Ion Detonator all make a comeback, although this game changes up a couple of them a little bit. The Ion Detonator is now usable whenever you freeze time, and it doesn't harm Crypto when he's too close to an explosion, and the Anal Probe now shoots multiple probes that can lock on, hitting either one person with multiple probes or individual multiple targets with individual probes. In addition, he gets the Black Hole Gun, which is pretty self-explanatory, the Super Baller, which shoots a ball that locks onto enemies and sends them bouncing around, causing large shockwaves that damage things nearby, and the Venus Human Trap, which is a giant man-eating plant. There's also the Dislocator again, if you're into that. Gastro, the Zombie Gun, etc. are all conspicuously absent. For mental abilities, Crypto has the Cortex Scan, PK, Hypnosis, Body Snatching, Disco Fever, which replaces Free Love, Extract, Transmog, PK Magnet, which lets you send stuff flying towards things like a magnet, and of course, Temporal Fist. And all of these powers are upgraded by leveling up in the Paths of Enlightenment. Additionally, the Cortex Scan during Body Snatch now refills the health of the person you're inhabiting. They also streamlined the way the game plays by setting up PK exclusively on the left trigger, while keeping other mental abilities on the Mental Lock menu used by holding down the left bumper all of the earlier games. And now you can use PK while using your jetpack, you can use weapons while using PK or Mental Lock, and because of the way it's set up, you can also use Mental Lock to lock on to enemies in order to aim your shots with your weapons. The saucer in this game is newer than the one we've seen before since Crypto crashed the previous one in front of the space dust. The new saucer still uses a shield that refills via draining things, plus it has a cloak. And it still has the Death Ray, Abducto Beam, and Quantum Deconstructor, which can now be manually charged to do even more damage than it already did. It also gains the Plasma Cannons, which are basically Plasma Turrets, the Seeker Drones, which are basically heat-seeking missiles, and the Tornado Tron, which interestingly enough can be used while cloaked as well, and it spawns a dangerous tornado that does quite a bit of damage. The Sonic Boom and all of the other weapons the Saucer ever had are gone, and there's no Gene Blender. This new Saucer can also mass abduct humans, which slightly refills the shields and gives DNA. From outside the Saucer, Crypto can access the Meditation Chamber to level up in the Paths of Enlightenment, and he can spend his DNA at the Poxmar to upgrade his weapons or his Saucer. DNA is easy to get via mass abduction and is also earned whenever you complete a mission. In fact, I barely touched the side content during the story and I still was able to buy most of the upgrades without any trouble, so the game may be a little bit too generous in terms of the DNA. Odd Jobs and Arcvoodle's landing zones return as well, although there's no Cult of Arcvoodle, 
as that fell out of favor, according to the game, earlier in the 1970s, while, of course, the Lunarians got really popular. The alert system is pretty standard fare, with cops, soldiers, Molinari mobsters in Los Paradiso, White Dragon members in Shenlong, Francodyne guards in Belleville, and Nexos warriors, who are basically the law enforcement on Planet Furon, and who appear in story missions elsewhere in the game. You get the idea, this is a Destroy Humans game, it kind of follows the same rules that all the other ones do. Unfortunately, this is also the last Destroy All Humans game, which is kind of sad, considering the fact that the ending of the game sets up a sequel. And there's lots of reasons why this is the last Destroy All Humans game, so let's get into them. Path of the Furon is infamous for killing off the Destroy All Humans franchise, which is quite upsetting. Let's take a look at the factors that caused this to happen. The first, and probably the most obvious to me anyway, is that Pandemic Studios was purchased by Electronic Arts, leaving the young series without its original development studio just two and a half years into its existence. That much is pretty damaging on its own. On top of that, as I said before, economics screwed THQ over. Of course, they were pretty badly mismanaged as well. In 2007, their fiscal year ended with a billion dollars in revenue, net profiting $68 million. But by 2008, with the economic recession in full force, THQ's fortunes changed completely, and they never could recover. As a perfect storm of bad sales, bad press, mismanagement, and internal turmoil led to the company's downfall in January 2013, just four years later. This game suffers from the fact that it was released very early into that perfect storm of calamity. To begin with, the game was developed by Sandblast Games, who, as I said, I can only confirm developed two games before this one. And even then, those were under a different name, and one of those games was only the GameCube port of the given game. Obviously, Sandblast wasn't exactly Rockstar North, you know. They didn't have a whole lot of experience at all in game development, and the game itself shows this. The graphics aren't very good. I know the graphics are not everything, and I would never argue that they are. I mean, heck, I'm a retro gamer. You know, these games don't exactly look perfect all the time. But Path of the Furon has really bad graphics. The textures look very muddy and lackluster, like they're low resolution or something. And some of the designs in the game look very lazy, particularly the taxi cabs found inside of Shenlong which are basically just blue cars with the word taxi lazily pasted onto the sides. Another thing that I noticed that constantly annoyed me was the weird, floaty, unnatural way that the cars on the road move. It just looks weird, especially with the pop-in, which you can see in this clip here. At a certain distance, cars are still moving around and you can still see them, but you can clearly see that it's a very crappy low poly version and the wheels don't even move. I know that a game can't handle to show every little thing all the time at every distance from every angle and all that, but most games know how to hide these quirks, or if nothing else, they know that they should hide these quirks, or they'll build a game around the quirks. And it just feels like Sandblast didn't think to do that, or didn't know to do that. Particularly in Lost Paradiso, but really just overall in the game, the atmosphere feels rather lifeless, as outside of cutscenes and missions, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot going on in the world. Earlier games included drive-in movies that people would go to see, hippies having shindigs and playing music, people forming food lines in Tunguska, homeless crazies rambling on incoherently, and all sorts of other atmospheric liveliness, while this one largely feels like a wasteland. I know the game is called Destroy All Humans, but come on, where's the humanity? For that matter, if you want me to destroy all humans, then give me some humans to destroy. Come on, guys, it's not that hard. Performance-wise, the game's not that hot either, with a notably chugging frame rate through much of it. It suffers from what I'm going to call Liberty City Stories Syndrome, because I don't want to name it after this game, where the frame rate is generally noticeably chugging along and while its default frame rate is not so low that it's unplayable, it's often a bit lower than a reasonable frame rate should actually be. 
It's a shame that I named it after Liberty City Stories because I actually quite like that game, but it's another great example of this issue. Overall, in terms of the aesthetic stuff, I think it looks okay with the somewhat cartoony style that they introduced here, and I think that the saucer and the guns, both the redesigned ones and the ones that look basically the same, I think they all look cool. But the graphics are not up to snuff, and you could argue that the original two games are better in this regard, despite the fact that they're on inferior hardware. Gameplay-wise, all I have to say is that there's some great changes in streamlining in this game's version of the format that in a really good game would be incredible, but Sandblast never got to realize the gameplay to its full potential. Story-wise, I actually quite enjoy this one, as it feels like a logical continuation from Destroy All Humans 2. If you missed my Big Wooly Unleashed review, I lamented quite a bit during that review that after the grand scale of Destroy All Humans 2, Big Willy Unleashed scaled things down and went to the ridiculously dull plot of a fast food guy versus a fast food guy. If I wanted to see that, I'd be watching Spongebob, not playing Destroy All Humans. This game follows up the scale of the Soviet Bliss Conspiracy ending on the moon from Destroy All Humans 2 by having Crypto systematically work through a bunch of people before finally unveiling a conspiracy by Emperor Meningitis, only to realize that it was all the Masters doing all along, and only realizing it on Planet Furon after killing Emperor Meningitis. If not for the unrealized potential of the game as a whole, this story could have easily made this the best game of the series on its own, and I stand firmly by that. That may not be a popular opinion, but it's what I think on the matter, and I'm going to stand by it. This game was screwed by THQ shutting down Sandblast Games in November of 2008, just a little under a month prior to the game's release. Because of this, it's a very buggy game, as this footage shows. Path of the Furon was made by a very inexperienced game developer who had never got enough time to make the game feel truly whole. And I want to go on record right now and say that while Sandblast is responsible for this game in the very literal sense as they're the actual people who programmed and designed and developed it, I don't hold any ill will or, or malintent towards them. In fact, I feel bad for them being screwed over during the development of a game that could have been the big project that made them famous, with the ensuing failure and the shutdown during development leaving Sandblast Games completely forgotten to history by most. No, I blame THQ for this mess. THQ did a lot of stupid things back then. If they hadn't, they might still be in business. The first two Destroy All Humans games were great, they published some of the greatest wrestling and sports games ever, and they had beloved, if cult, franchises like Red Faction, which, while at times rather neglected by THQ themselves, always managed to keep a cult fandom. But THQ did a lot of dumb things. This is one of them. They fucked up pretty hard here. Don't buy it. Hell, I'd argue don't play it at all even if it was free, because you'd still be getting ripped off because you're losing your time. I just hate the fact that after 12 years of me being a fan of Destroy All Humans, I see this young series die after just three and a half years, just four games. And at least if you were playing back then, you got to see it happen in real time and you didn't have all those years of buildup. But me, I've got a decade worth of build-up on this. And it's painful. I'm sorry, Pox. Crypto. Gastro, Arc Voodle, all of you charming, charming characters. I guess this is just how it all ends. Now with a bang. But with a whimper. In times like these, it's clear to me that as I look upon this work of art, as some may call it, I am truly gazing into an abyss. An abyss of sorrow, torture, torment, pain. But, as a wise woman once said, one must choose in life between boredom suffering.